Past performance may not be indicative of future results. Therefore, no current or prospective client should assume that the future performance of any specific investment, investment strategy, including the investments and or investment strategies recommended and or purchased by advisor or product made reference to directly or indirectly will be profitable. Different types of investment involve varying degrees of risk and there can be no assurance that any specific investment will either be suitable or profitable for a client's investment portfolio. No client or prospective client should assume that any information presented serves as the receipt of or substitute for personalized investment advice from the advisor or any other investment professional. Welcome to the Bullington Capital Report, hosted by Bill Bullington. For the next hour, you'll receive information on current market conditions and trends that could affect your financial future. If you have a question, you can participate in today's program by calling 216-901-0945. That's 216-901-0WHK. You can also reach Bill by going to his website, BullingtonCapital.com. And now, here's Bill Bullington. Well, welcome back. The, uh, nothing is as uh, constant as change. <laughs> Uh wow, there's, there's been a lot of stuff going on. Really interesting that uh, the market's been so weak lately, and um, yet I'm seeing a lot of stocks coming up on scans, which are based on momentum, short-term momentum, and the list is fairly long. It's, it's, you would never know by looking at this that the market is still off you know, about 14% or so from, its, uh, from the high that it reached in January of 2022. So, um, yeah, it's, sometimes, you know, looks can be deceiving. Uh, so uh, am I really too concerned? Not really. Um, and we'll come back to this topic a little bit later. There were a lot of stocks that showed up on momentum scans that have pretty good valuations. So last part of today's show, I thought it would be good. Maybe we'll cover some of those and uh, might be some opportunities there. Um, and I just want to you know, take a second here to talk about that. You know, I, I do some individual stocks in my own accounts, and I recommend if you really like it that you try to give it a shot. You know, the, uh, you might find out that you like it more than you thought you did, or what's going to happen is you're going to find out that yeah, you really don't really care too much, and that's fine. You still have to have stocks, and I think the the experience that you get would be a good thing. And I'm going to tell you point blank, 19 out of 20 people are going to find out that, yeah, you know what, I, don't, I really don't like this. And that's fine. That, that's actually what keeps people like me employed. Um, but you need to find out. You know, who knows? Maybe you'll be really good at it and you'll really like it. Um, maybe you'll not like it at all and do what I do with 80% of my money and put it into funds um, that are using these things called algorithms. That's just a fancy term for um, a formula, and uh, based on you know, sales growth, profitability, size, that kind of thing, uh, stuff that really makes sense, and uh, you know, having a a good strategy, knowing that the funds that you're investing in have been selected based on the strategies that they're running, not just the returns. Um, one of the reasons returns are important, but the best performing funds on any given a one or two year time period are going to be the ones that just took a ton of risk and and it paid it happened to pay off for them and at some point in time uh, that they take too much risk or they can't keep doing that and then the fund performs very poorly and so that's kind of uh, I see that quite often and we're, we're also going to talk a little bit more about the uh, fixed indexed products and those are annuities I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. That's my It's my favorite type. There are fixed annuities, too. And the fixed annuities are generally not paying quite as much as the fixed indexed. But they're easier to understand. And sometimes you can get them with uh, much shorter maturities. Uh, in, in other words, a much shorter time period where you could take all of the money out without being penalized. So that's kind of one of the advantages to a regular fixed annuity. Fixed index annuity is going to be somewhere between eight and ten years on average that you'd have to that you'd 
actually have to pay a penalty if you pulled out all the money. If you're just taking income or you can take up to 10% of the principal with most of them each year, then no problem. You're not going to pay any penalty. And uh, the penalties tend to go down over time. And at some point in time, you're not paying any penalty. So it's a, uh, uh, yeah, it's a very, I think, a very competitive alternative because of the returns that they're willing to guarantee that they put onto a schedule. I think it's extremely competitive with what most people are, are going to be earning in their stock portfolios over the next five or 10 years. Why am I saying that? Well, if you look at the portfolio value, I'm sorry, if you look at stock valuation from the biggest to most popular stocks, the ones that make up the vast majority of the S&P 500, they're not undervalued by any stretch of the imagination. So in fact, you could say they're still a little bit overpriced despite the fact that they're about 15% below their all-time high, which has reached more than a year ago. That does have a lot of people upset right now, by the way. And the reason that they're upset is because they didn't expect that to happen. And and I've always expected it. And probably one of the reasons that uh, I'm still working is I know the minute I retire, market's going to go down, stay down for probably four or five years. (laughs) So I have to stay working so that it doesn't do that. I'm just kidding. But... uh, Anyway, um, and that's one of the reasons now with interest rates coming up, you know, I'm seeing uh, I have, there's a short-term bond fund that I really like, and I like it a lot. I would give you the symbol on it. You're going to have to call me or hit me up with an email because we're just not allowed to do that anymore, and I don't want to take the risk. I mean, the disclaimers I'd have to use, and, and then I'd still be, uh, you know, I get audited a lot, and uh, we have to be very careful about what we say on the air especially when you manage money yourself. Uh, so there's a fund. It's a short-term fund. It invests in mostly government securities. It'll do some super high-quality short-term bonds from uh, big company corporations. And uh, I really like that. It's my favorite fixed income fund. Uh, outside of that, I guess my second favorite would be just buying treasuries or buying CDs from banks that are all over the country. Now, this is really important. In fact, I I have an article that I'm going to get to right after the first commercial break. I'm going to read the article. It's uh, about the Chase transaction with First Republic. You know, Chase bought First Republic Bank. And uh, the article is what customers need to know. Incidentally, this is one of the articles I sent out this week to my uh, newsletter subscribers. I have a service that suggests various articles that showed up. This one, this article showed up in the Wall Street Journal on May 1st. And uh, we sent it out on Friday, and it gives some explanation as to what you might want to know or what you can expect from the merger between Chase and First Republic Bank. There's no cost to get that, by the way. Um, I, I probably have four or 500 people that, that get it. The vast majority of them are not even clients. And uh, and I'm going to tell you, if they've never asked me to call, uh, I haven't called them. <laughs> I have a hard time talking to the people that want to talk to me, so that, that's a good thing. Um, but anyway, if you wanted to sign up for that, you, you'd be able to do that. And we will uh, come back to that, that article uh, in a little bit. And then again, we'll come back to you know, the individual stocks. Um, we'll cover uh, indexed annuities and fixed indexed annuities. I, you know, for years I didn't bother with those things. I just didn't think that the guarantees were high enough to warrant my attention. And now that's, you know, I, they're probably going to pay more than the average person ends up averaging on their stock portfolio. Now, I just said the average person, if you're with us, you're going to be above average, although we're going to try to be above average. We can't promise that. And and I can tell you some clients, I'm, I'm getting them calling and they're thinking about going to cash. Bad idea. I mean, that is not a good idea. Um, what you're su- supposed to be doing is you're supposed to evaluate your risk tolerance. You're supposed to look at the uh, what the stock market's long-term returns are, how they are achieved, not just what they are. 
Because if you don't know how they're achieved, you're going to be scared out at some point in time. And that's the point that a lot of people are getting to. So if you're nervous, yeah, this is why you have a financial advisor. You should be calling. What are we doing? Uh, what What is your plan? And the plan should be, well, we're going to stick to the plan that we had in place you know, unless something drastic has has changed. If If you're down more than we had anticipated, that might be something that you want to take a look at. Why is it down more than you had anticipated? Uh, if suddenly you uh, have a really big expense that you didn't expect, okay, those are legitimate reasons. But the market being down, not a legitimate reason. If you didn't know the market fluctuated a lot before you invested, you made a mistake. And your advisor made a mistake. You, know, you should be, all you advisors that are listening out there, I know you're out there. The, uh, you should be talking to your clients about this. You should be showing them how volatile the stock market can be. If you don't have the software, there's a company out there. It's called Telechart. The product's TC2000. Get it. Show it to them. It'll show you the S&P 500 going way here. I'll, actually, I'm going to try to find that. How far back does that actually go? And I'm going to go monthly. Okay. It goes back to 1960 now. That is uh, that is really cool. Yeah. And here's – if you went to 65, this is what's really interesting. So this is 66, 1966. And in 1978, so 12 years, sound familiar? The market had just what a lot of – technicians called channeling. It had gone up and gone down, gone up and gone down, gone up and down a lot. And for 12 years before it actually stayed above that level, the highest level that it had reached back in 1966. So sound familiar? Uh, you go up the early 2000s, you had two 50% corrections once starting in May of 2000. Uh, the next one, the market had just recovered, just recovered in uh, 2007 from the peak that, that occurred in 2000. So seven years later, you just got back to break even. And this time it goes down more than it did first time. <laughs> Lovely. If you didn't know that or if you haven't seen that from your advisor, you need to get a new advisor. I'm not kidding. Because the, the chances of us not having to experience something like that in your lifetime, if, if, if you're under the age of 70, see, there's a really high chance that you're going to go through another period like that. And if you're not prepared for it, you're going to be really upset. And that's why you don't hear me uh, with fear in my voice, because I've expected it. I, this is just normal. The correction that's been going on right now, it, uh, here, what month did it peak? It peaked in the month uh, of January 2022. So here we are in May of 2023, and it's down about 14% or so. That's more than a year. And why am I not upset? Well, because I expected it. And uh, I didn't know it was going to come at that particular moment. What I mean is I, I know that stocks can jump up or down 50% or more, and that's within the range of normal. And I'm not willing to tell people anything differently. If you're going to be in the stock market, you've got to expect that. And if that's too much risk for you, reduce the amount that you have inside. You're going to need the stocks because in the long run, nothing has kept up with stocks as an investment uh, as far as your traditional investment. Bonds haven't done it. Real estate hasn't done it. Uh, gold hasn't done it. So everything that's more traditional that you could have invested in, stocks are the better, are the better category. At least they have been for the past 100 years or so. But that comes with a price. The price is you have to watch them fluctuate wildly, and you'll have all these people coming out of the woodwork saying, see, I saw this coming. See if you go. And anybody can go print a chart and show you something that's happened in the past and say, yeah, this is when I said, yeah, right. Let me see this, the statements, the trading statements to verify that. Uh, and somebody's telling you that it's, they're just they're not working in your best interest, I guess. That's, a, that's just where I'm going to leave it. But Anyway, so it's not easy. Um, stocks aren't 
grossly overpriced right now, that would get me really worried. Um, that was the case back in 2000. The vast majority of stocks were overpriced by a lot, not a little, a lot. In 2007, 2008, they weren't nearly as overpriced, but they went down 57% anyway. <laughs> by the way, the, the fact that that was an election year had a massive impact on that because nobody could get anything done. You know, they were, it was an election year, and, and they were uh, the whole administrations were changing. New people come in, and old people going out. New president, and they were stuck. There was nothing that that could. That reminded me of that movie. I know some of you are probably try, probably tired of hearing this story, but uh, there's this movie about this uh, fisherman out there, and uh, everywhere he turned, there were three storms, and uh, I can't even remember the name of it, but. Uh, Anyway, this fishing boat gets caught between these three. There's no way out, <laughs> and that's what this remind. That's what that reminded me of. 2007, 2008. I'm like, oh no. I mean, if that would have happened at any other time, it would have knocked off nine months. Uh, the, the market would have recorded at least nine months earlier because the big correction came in uh, the fourth quarter of 2008. Started early in the fourth. Actually, it started in um, 2007 in mid and small caps and emerging markets, the, uh, it didn't get the big boys until later that a few months later. And by 2008 it was in a full, you know, uh, bear market. And that was the election year. So there was nothing that the older Congress that many of them had lost their seats could do. And uh, it was going to take another three or four months for the new administration to get in and get up to speed. So I was looking at that going, wow, <laughs> this is uh, this is such bad luck. But uh, you see what the market's done since then. I mean, that was those are big, big drops. But even if you came in and your luck was really bad and you bought at the top, okay, let's say you bought at the top. The uh, S&P 500 is up 170% then from buying at the worst possible time. And uh, it's up 170% since then, plus your dividend. So I got about 20 seconds here before I have to take a commercial break. Um, the number to call, 216-901-0945, if you want to ask a question when we get back. And this is Bill Bullington right here on 1420. I'll be back right after these messages. Well, welcome back. This is Bill Bullington. I'm here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon. If you hear something on this show and you'd like more information on it, feel free to go to my website. That's BullingtonCapital.com. Just reach out on the contact me form and we will try to get back to you as quickly as possible. And I have to apologize. We used this company who was purchased. They were the largest CRM, customer resource management software company in my industry. And they were sold. And the integration has not been as smooth as they would have liked and certainly as, as smooth as we would have liked. So I'm getting emails rejected, and I'm not finding out that they're getting rejected for three or four days. So you may just want to call at 330-664-0700. That number again, 330-664-0700. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you, um, this right around the pandemic is when this merger went through. So you got that going for you. You're working with a, a skeleton crew to begin with. And then you're integrating two of the largest companies in my, in an industry that's huge. And it's been rough. Uh, that's all I have to say. It's just been rough. So um, uh, it is improving, you know, slowly but surely. But uh, anyway, so one other thing, we were talking a little bit about stuff. I'll come back to that a little bit later. We were also talking about uh, the um, indexed annuities. And, you know, when you look at the – Stock market returns in the long run, you look at where valuations are, I, I really feel like the stock market's going to have a tough time keeping up. It can, 
and there's particularly, I think if you're invested in healthcare uh, technology, uh, healthcare's gotten beat up pretty good this past couple of years, which is a good sign uh, for me anyway, that's for the buy low, sell high people. The uh, uh, population's aging, healthcare costs are rising faster than the overall rate of inflation, and those are the revenues that the healthcare organizations are generating. And they've come out with some amazing stuff, some of it because they had to, because we had the pandemic, and we're still dealing with that. But then they, you know, all the other pro- uh, problems that come along with aging, and when uh, the fastest growing segment of your population is 60 and over. The, uh, that's actually kind of a good place to be if you provide uh, medical services or products. So, you know, I think overweighting that's probably a pretty good idea. If you don't want to do those things, that's no problem. When we sit down with someone, I'm going to try to figure out what the best portfolio is for you. And all of our portfolios look uh, a little bit similar, but I don't have two that are identical. I mean, none. And that's one of the advantages, I think, of of being a smaller advisor. I can listen and I can customize the portfolios to what somebody's actually looking for, what they want to do, and what kind of risks that they want to take. And this past uh, couple of years, people don't realize it, but uh, the bond fund that I've been uh, using, I think, is it's uh, you know it's in the top four or five percent of its group. And I uh, can't promise that. I uh, can't talk about the specific returns. Can't give you the symbol unless you call in and we're, we're, we have a scheduled meeting and I, I have to get you a whole bunch of other information. But it's a, uh, you know, it, makes it, it can make a difference. And uh, having the flexibility, I think, is really important, um, especially today. Man, it's just, uh, it's tough. I, I, I do think we're past the toughest part. Why am I saying that? Well, because interest rates are a lot higher than they were two or three years ago. That was rough. You're looking at the best performing um, fixed income investments out there paying less than 1%. That's rough. That takes a lot out of your total return. Fortunately, it's not like that today. You've got a lot of options that are significantly better than that. And uh, again, you know, I come back to these uh, fixed index annuity, the rates that they're guaranteeing are higher if you believe Dalbar or not. Uh, they're higher than what people have averaged in their stock portfolios over the last 20 years. Now that, that's amazing. And the uh, it's a guaranteed number. It's a floor. And everybody will always point, the people that I, I know, uh, well, some of the people I've heard in the industry that, that sell these things um, typically are looking at the potential for growth, and they emphasize that a lot. Uh, But you also have some guarantees. And and I'm going to tell you that the potential for growth is very limited. The chances of you outperforming the the guaranteed portion uh, are pretty remote. And uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. So I don't like to emphasize that. What I'm really looking for is, okay, worst worst case scenario, what are you guaranteeing me? That's what I'm interested in because I'm replacing fixed income. I'm not replacing stocks with this. There's no way this is going to keep up to the stock market over the next 20 years, and that's Bill Bullington's opinion. That's not written down anywhere, and it's not a law or a rule. Uh, but I just can't imagine uh, annuities outperforming stocks over the next 20 years. Over the next 5 or 10, yeah, I could see that. I could see it happening. Because the, the rates that they're willing to pay, the guaranteed rates, are high enough that I could see that, yep, with the valuations being where they are in stocks, I don't know that they'll be able to beat that over the next five or ten years. I don't know. I think it's really, really close. And when you call in uh, to find out what the current rates are, you'll find out why the, uh, and why I'm saying that. And I don't have enough time really to go through that today. Maybe I'll come back to that subject um, next week. But anyway, another thing I wanted to uh, let people know is that there is a uh, one of the companies that we deal with uh, provides a, a software package that makes the financial planning process pretty simple, and I really like that. I, I'm a minimalist. Uh, don't fill my head with a whole bunch of stuff that I really don't need to know. 
Unfortunately, in my industry, there's a lot of stuff that you really do need to know, but I would say out of the material that you hear or see, the stuff that I get in my email, maybe one out of 10 that you actually need to know. So you have to weed through a lot of crap, and I, I know I feel so bad for people that don't do this for a living because I'll be reading something, and after five minutes, I'm like, oh, okay, they, they go to a certain point, and I recognize, yeah, this is not what, not that important. I can delete that. But if you didn't know and you had to look up all the uh, definitions in an accounting and finance dictionary the way I did for the first five years of my <laughs> of my career, uh, after having studied economics and minoring in finance in college, the uh, it's a lot. Uh, the con- concepts are uh, not that much, but you know I've got a caller here, and hang on one second. Oh, this is Dave, and uh, Dave, you had a question for us? Yeah, I have a question for you on uh, regional banks. Uh, I was wondering what your view is on, um, of course, they've been cut in half, so the dividend yields are real high now, real real lucrative. I was wondering if, if you think they'll cut them either because they have to or they'll just normalize them. Uh, well, that's going to be on a bank-to-bank um, operation. I mean, if if they really slow down because they jack up interest rates, they may have to cut the dividends because they're not going to have as much revenue. You know, when people raise interest rates, the number of people that actually qualify for a loan uh, will drop down. Hey, I, I can hear me uh, in the background on your <laughs> your radio. I, I think that. No, well, I got it. I got it down. Okay. All right. I, I that sounds it off. good. Okay, must have been at the station. The uh, nope. but anyway, so if we get a uh, uh, if, if it really hurts the banks badly, they're going to have to raise interest rates. That's going to hurt their profit margins. Their profits are going to go down, and their share prices may go down as a result. But you know what? Your guess is about as good as anybody's. Uh, if okay. the bank's really healthy. And the, the share prices come down, and they don't—they're not raising up their reserve requirements for expecting losses. And uh, hey, you, you might have a pretty good opportunity there. I, think. I guess you might as well just flip a quarter, though. <laughs> guess that's what, <laughs> that's basically the amount of information they've given us so far. You know, it, more information will be coming out on it, but okay, so it's too soon. Yeah, yeah, it, I think it's a lot too soon. Unless you really, I, if you know someone at the bank that works there and, and has, you know, ties, they're not supposed to talk, you know, they're not supposed to give out information. But, um, and you can also go to their websites, look up the uh, investors uh, or the, the most recent quarterly report and what the management has to say. And uh, they, they're pretty f- straightforward. That That's what I think is kind of funny about this. I hear so many speculative things that are being said. Managers are supposed to report as quickly as they know. Um, there are forms you have to fill out with the SEC when there's something, a material fact that it, that comes out that may affect your company's future. You, you can't just hide that. <laughs> you, you, you have to write up the report. I think it's called an AK. I can't remember now. It's been so long since I've looked at it. But you have to let people know, hey, there's something going on here, and you, you might want to or you may need to know about it. So. Uh, you can find mm-hmm. anything you want, anything that, that is material. Now, there are lots of rumors that go around by different companies. Occasionally, somebody uh, passes a rumor around that happens to be true, and they're going to have to, if, if they ever get called out on the carpet for that, they're going to have to claim that, you know, and prove that you know, they just guessed and they're right because anything else is insider trading and you're going to do some time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it, it's hard to get. Well, I guess of one the, of the uh, reasons I, I'm following up on it because, uh, like, locally here at Key, I guess uh, one executive bought uh, about a million dollars worth of Key, in a you know the yield I forget what it's at seven eight percent now because of course it, it got basically have like a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, that's a um, uh, that can be a really good clue. When the management's stepping up and buying shares in its company, 
Now, I've seen the guys buy shares in their company right before it went bankrupt, by the way, and they were CEOs. Hmm. So Whoa. there's no um, surefire way to, to tell whether or not it's going to be a, a successful investment. But generally, it's considered a pretty good sign if the upper-level management's buying shares. So, hmm. but, okay. But, uh, any other uh, questions or did I answer the no, question that, that you asked? Okay. All right. Well, hey, have, uh, thanks good. for listening to the show, and uh, have a good rest of the weekend. You too. Bye. Bye. Yep. And if you'd like to call 216-901-0945, 216-901-0945. And, uh, oh, I, you know, I was talking about that little estimate. Uh, this tool is very nice. And um, I'm on a mission, by the way. <laughs> The mission is to reduce or, or to uh, yeah re- take a lot of the noise out around financial planning. Uh, the people in my industry just love to create three and four syllable words to describe things, and they'll do a dozen when one one syllable word would have been would have sufficed and would have got you to where you need to go. And, uh, and I know people think I talk like that a lot, and I probably do, but uh, uh, reality is I'm going to make it a huge point of contention to try to get this information out as simply as possible. And let me give an example. So I was looking at today, The uh, I've got a client coming up, wants to retire, uh, wants to know, hey, do I have enough income? I made pretty decent income, got about a half a million bucks, going to get a pension, get Social Security, but... Uh, what do I do? What do they do with that? I'm going to get about 25,000 Social Security and uh, another 25,000 pension. It's about $50,000 coming in just in Social Security and pension. And they, uh, they're they moderate. They don't want to take a ton of risk. They got half a million bucks. So what what could they expect to be able to spend in addition to that $50,000 that they're going to have in uh, retirement income? And the, the uh, oh, my computer just went down. That's lovely. <laughs> oh, here we go. It's coming back up. So a sustainable income for them, in addition to the $50,000 they'll have from Social Security and Pension, uh, would be about $80,000, including the uh, income that they could take from their portfolio that was uh, invested Moderately, basically 50% stocks, 50% bonds. So that number, that 30000 bucks, is going to come out of the half a million dollars they have, and that should last them a lifetime if they uh, live to normal life expectancy. Actually, they live to longer than the normal life expectancy. And so I have this tool. That's where I got these numbers. And it, you put your age in there, your income, and uh, how much you have in savings. It'll tell you what is sustainable income level is. And realistically, you're done. That That's all you need to know. Uh, well, I, I shouldn't say that's all you need to know. What you really need to know is, can you live on $80,000? Is $80,000 a livable wage uh, for you? And if not, you know, you've got a couple choices. You can try to take more risk. I wouldn't recommend that. You could uh, pick up some part-time work. You know, that that's can be a great idea. And I've known people who got up to retirement age and said, you know what, I'm, uh, I'm not ready to retire, but I don't like my current job. I think I'm going to go get another job. In, uh, and then they started investing in real estate, uh, which some people had always wanted to do. And they, they end up uh, loving it and doing very well. And they didn't really have to do it. I think that's a big part of it. They didn't have to do the work if they didn't want to because they could have gotten by on on the $80,000. It was roughly 80% of what they made before they retired. So that's typically what you're shooting for is about an 80% replacement rate on uh, how much did you make before retirement. If you could replace that with 80% of that income, you can typically get by. Not good enough for this dude. So, uh, which is fine, you know, so, but he didn't have to stay at the job that he really didn't like all that much. And now he's out there, he's working because he wants to and, and loving life. 
That, that's a beautiful thing. But bought a, a new house, moved from his old house. Uh, is but you bought a fixer upper, and it, it's super nice now. And just it, it's really good to see that kind of stuff. These kinds of things are the things that you should probably start thinking about as soon as you get out of college, actually. But you know, when, if you're in your uh, late 40s, early 50s, it, it's not too late. Uh, if you wait too long, if you're past 60 when you start trying to do retirement planning, that's rough. Man, that is really rough. But I think I only have a couple minutes until I have to take a commercial break here, so I'm just going to plug my website one more time. It's uh, BullingtonCapital.com, and uh, my name is Bill Bullington. I'm here, I'm here every Saturday morning, 11 to noon. If you'd like to see a projection for yourself, uh, like the one that I just did, with this software package, it's pretty cool. It actually comes from the, uh, the world's largest asset manager. So you figure they must know a thing or two about investment planning. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, yeah, you can go to my website, spillingtoncapital.com. You can call us. That's probably the best way, by the way, is just calling. And that's 330 Three three zero six six four zero seven zero zero, and uh, somebody will call you back. I've been wandering through the desert, ain't seen a cloud in forever over me, but I believe your rain is coming. Or visit JoyceFactoryDirect.com. And we're back. This is Bill Bullington here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon. Um, you can reach me on my website uh, if you'd like to, or just call us at 330-664-0700. Leave a message if you have a question you'd like to get answered. And I do have a caller on the line right now, and I'm going to try to go to that. And this is John. Hey, John, welcome to the Bullington Capital Report. Bill, to amen to whatever you said or you have been saying for years, we don't even teach the curriculum of capitalism at the high school level. We say you need a soil right. testing before the foundation is put. Capitalism, we don't teach that. And when you said about right. all the sound, I'd like to add a little extra homework besides your Saturday program, and that is Warren Buffett, once a year, he has a wonderful annual conference at Omaha, Nebraska. And I right. think the guy of the age, Get them addicted to that program. How noiselessly he tells the people what he is achieving as a group. Yeah. And top down, noisy out. Well, so much decentralization. Power doesn't have to be at the top. You know? Right. He has yep. done a beautiful job. And whenever you think of Geico, it is almost bankrupt me when he took it over. Yes. And that is yes. Yep. People don't understand the history of this country and capitalism. And I've thought I know, always, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's too uh, bad, you know, because a, a 12 year old today could easily uh, understand the information. They're just more advanced than than we were at their age. <laughs> and uh, everybody is, everybody, everybody's more advanced. So they, should they could get it at the age of 12. They should teach their grandchildren, the school board, whether it's Ohio State, yeah. give the curriculum or not. Give them through the local right. library, anywhere you can, to make them understand why you need a soil test before you put the foundation. How is that? That sounds really good. That, that's a good one. I'm going to remember yeah, that's that. It. That's the <laughs> way in the foreign language I use to keep on pushing, yeah. pushing. You know me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hey, thanks for calling. After that, that's a good idea, and I'll remember to, to try to start to uh, talk about that. I did go in uh, once. I... Uh, I have a client who retired as a school teacher, and uh, she had me come into her class, and uh, it was really fun. The kids liked it a lot, and uh, I think they, I hope they got a lot out of it. I know when I was 12, I had a paper route, and so I we had to pay for the papers whether the client, whether our customers paid for them or not. <laughs> Can you imagine that 12 year old kid? Yeah, you got to pay for the paper when the guy moves out. Uh, of the apartment building that you were delivering his paper to and doesn't pay you, you got to pay for that out of your pocket. <laughs> and uh, so I learned really quickly, oh, business, they, they really mean business when they're talking about business. But it was a good experience overall. and It helped me a lot. 
understand businesses. But uh, by the way, uh, Warren Buffett had the largest paper route in Omaha. He delivered more papers than any other kid. He was actually hiring other kids to deliver the papers, and he was taking an override <laughs> when he was 12 years old. I don't know if that's actually true, but that was in his authorized biography. So I just imagine it's probably true. But at any rate, um, yeah, I've got about, uh, oh, maybe 10 more minutes. And I was just talking about, you know, stocks. I think if, if you're looking out over the next 10 years, I think you're fine. Uh, if you're looking out over the next two or three, toss a quarter. Whether or not they're going to be higher than they are now, um, toss a quarter because they're not super undervalued right now. If you're going to be taking income within the next five years, I would definitely be looking at the uh, indexed annuities. I'm just looking at the air, somebody that was 67, okay, and that's the full Social Security age right now. And by the time I get there, it's probably going to be 72. <laughs> I don't know. The uh, but anyway, full Social Security age, for every $100,000 that, that you put in, uh, you got to wait 12 months to start taking this, by the way. Uh, the, the guaranteed income today is $7,154 for somebody who is 67 when they start taking the income. That's pretty good. I mean, that's actually higher. This, this is the one reason I started talking about these. And it's so funny because my stock – investors that have been listening to the show for a year thought that I had turned on them. I'm like, no, I haven't turned on you guys. Stocks are still an important part of everybody's portfolio, but not everybody has enough money to take the kind of risk that they would have to take to generate that type of return out of the stock market. Uh, in fact, I'm going to say very few people have the kind of money that it would take to be able to uh, generate those returns and uh, um, put up with the amount of risk that they would have to take. That, that's when I started changing my tune on these a little bit because I'm watching and trying to look out for my client's best interest. Heck, if my clients suffer, um, my practice suffers big time. You, know, you hurt, so do I. Yeah, that, that's the way I think all businesses should be. And uh, so anyway, I just thought, you know, you can put 100000 bucks in here. They're going to give you... $7,150, that's if you're 67 next year, so you'd be 66 this year when you actually put it in. And then each year, if you didn't really need it, the next year, it would go up to $7,824. If you still didn't need it, you could put it off, and the next year, the, the guaranteed lifetime income is $8,541. And it goes up like that. The schedule goes up for 10 years. So it's a uh, it's really tough to beat. I mean, really tough. And and I know the Facebook ads and these other guys that are out there telling you, oh, no, you can, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You could, yeah, right. That I was looking at some of that stuff over the weekend too, because I had to upgrade a software package that I've been using for a long time. And I saw these ads from some people and just like, you gotta be kidding. Yeah, it, it's rough. I mean, it is rough out there because they, you know, they tell you what they want to hear. And I was in that category. Um, Way back when I was really young, I spent an enormous amount of money on stuff that just didn't work. And the bottom line is stocks can move in one of three directions, up, down, and sideways. And uh, in the long run, a company's value has a tendency to keep up with its growth in sales and its profit. In the short run, the share prices go all over the place based on what the current perception is. And it's the perception of the fund buyers, not the individual investors, because individual investors make up a super small percentage of the number of trades that go through every day. It's funds that are out there. And uh, I don't have an, enough time to, to go into that. And that's probably what I'm going to talk about next week. How, these funds, how are they picking the stocks that go in the fund? Because if you can name a strategy out there, Good, bad, or indifferent, there's a fund that's doing it. I'm telling you. There are more funds than there are stocks. And uh, so you know, it, that's one of the reasons it, it's gotten so much more difficult to outperform uh, stock market indexes is because there are fewer stocks now than there are funds for them to invest in. Or, or, yeah. So that, that's changed the dynamic a little bit. 
but it, it doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Uh, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with indexing. I'm, most of the funds I use are some form of, of an index fund, and they're in there for a reason. Uh, there are certain factors that do have a tendency to matter in the long run. The biggest factor, by the way, is sales. And when I say that, an awful lot of people who don't do this for a living think, oh, well, I just have to find the ones that, whose sales are going up the fastest. Well, no, not really. Uh, that's a big factor, but it's not the only factor. There's the uh, factor in there called value that's actually going to matter at some point in time and profitability. That's going to matter. Sales uh, growth is one thing. Profitability, number two. Uh, in the long run, those two factors have a tendency to make a big difference in how the fund is going to perform. And a lot of them have done really, really well over the years that they use those two factors as it, they're in the top three or four of the factors that they use completely. And so I think it's a, a good idea to know that uh, when you're looking at just so that's that's my that's my issue with the S and P 500. It's only using uh, it well. It's not using profitability. It's using the size of the company, and the size of the company is the single most important factor there. Actually, it's it's almost the only factor. They're just using size, and everybody think, oh well, look how good it's done. Yeah, it had a negative return for 13 years from 2000 to 2013. That's that's good. I'll take a lower return that's more consistent than that because you're going to need that when you get closer to retirement. And who wants to go through that anyway? And, yeah, when it's running, it runs like a, you know, it runs. like an extremely aggressive fund. And people don't realize just how aggressive that is. But I hear my uh, voice echoing in my ear. I guess my time must be getting close to being up here. And, uh, so this is Bill Bullington. I'm here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon. If you heard something you want more information on, just go to my website at uh, bullingtoncapital.com, or you can call us at 330-664-0700. Thanks for listening again, everybody. Have a good week, good investing, and good luck. just caught another edition of the Bullington Capital Report, broadcasting every Saturday at 11 a.m. on AM 1420, The Answer. If you have a question and you'd like to speak to Bill personally, the preceding program does not reflect those of AM 1420.